let's welcome Elder Donnell Digby, teaching on Divine Rebuild. I would like to take this opportunity to thank Apostle Wilson and Pastor Beverly Wilson for this opportunity to speak to the people. God bless you and thank you once again. Let us pray. Father, we come to your presence in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We're living in COVID times. We're living in times of uncertainty, God, but we know that you're yet still working behind the scene. We know that you're still working everything out for our good in this time of a rebuild. Speak to our hearts and speak to our minds. God, we make sound, but you make sense. So have your will and your way this day in us. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, good morning, everybody. Welcome to the Valley Experience. We're in a series this week, um, or for this month, really during Apostles' um, sabbatical, and we're dealing with the get ready. We've had uh, Pastor Sabrina Williams come up, and she talked about get ready to recreate. Pastor Jeff came up, and he talked about get ready to refocus, and then we had that preaching woman, Elder Sandra Camper. She preached about get ready for rebirth. And my part is to preach about, get ready, or teach about, get ready to rebuild. We're going to talk about a divine rebuild today. Rebuild means to put something that's good work in order, something that's been ineffective and outdated and has worn down. And everybody's trying to rebuild today. Now they're trying to rebuild and they broke it out into a survival mode. Because if we do not rebuild, many feel that we won't survive. Parents are trying to rebuild family lives to keep a handle on their children's social and educational needs. Businesses are reshaping their model of success to fight off going out of business and to grow in the present climate of the shutdown. Brick and mortar businesses are now going viral, changing their concept of reaching the customers because of the shutdown. Governments worldwide are changing the model of governing to support the economic health of their countries. Everybody is going through a rebuild. This global uh, COVID-inspired shutdown has caused all of us to sit down. Sitting down is a good time for a rebuild. There is such a powerful significance to sitting down that Paul tells us in the book of Ephesians that God has made us to sit down. It says that we're seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Sitting with God impacts every arena of your life and every spectrum of your going forth in awesome ways. So we know what's to come will impact worldwide economies, social views, and the moral character of the people that we meet. Our handbook of life talks about God ways with phrases like Psalms 46 and 10. It says simply be still and know that I am God. In other words, God is saying sit down and know that I am the Lord thy God and I will be exalted among the nations. We're worried about tomorrow, but God says I will be exalted In the earth, our divine rebuild is all about our position in the finished work of God. Our rebuild begins as we see ourselves seated in Christ Jesus. It requires us ignoring all that we have done for God and looking at what God has done for us. The finished works. The enemy of our future greatness is our present good. When you get stuck on what you're doing right now, you'll miss God as he began to do great, greater things in your life. The biggest enemy of your future greatness is the present good that you're doing right now. But we have to look to what God has accomplished. That is the foundation for our rebuild. Paul talks about forgetting those things that lie behind and pressing toward the mark of the high calling. Paul never ignored the ministries that he established, but his foundation for moving forward was always based on what God had already finished for him. Every new move in our lives is already finished in the plans of God. All we are doing is walking what walking out what God has put in place. It begins with us sitting and this calling is in this sitting and ends with the Holy Spirit leading us to greater works. God is calling us to do greater things and this calling is without repentance. You see, God continues to call us even in our failures, our disappointments our rejections, and in our successes. None of these things matter to when God begins to call you. Just as he called Joseph out of jail or Moses on the backside of the mountain, or even David when he was tending sheep and he raised him up 
and called him to tend to the flock of Israel. He is still calling you past your efforts and to the depths of his will. So today, let God will you through this rebuild. Listen as God call you into excellence, power, and might, that men might see this light of God in you and glorify God our Father. The word sit, it holds the center of attention in the first chapter of Ephesians for us, as Paul reveals the mysteries to the church. Ephesians 1, 17 through 21. I'm not going to take every verse. I'm going to take first part of 17, which says the God of our Lord Jesus Christ. I'm going to skip down now to the second part of chapter verse 21. And it says God raised him from the dead and made him to sit at his right hand in heavenly places. Far above all rule, authority, powers, dominions, and every name that's been named, not only in this world, but also in the world to come. There's another one. I have Ephesians for you too. Chapter 2, verses 6 and nine, 8 through 9. And it says, and God raised us up with him. And made us to sit with him in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. For by his grace you've been saved through faith and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God and not of works that no man should glory. The point I'm trying to get across to you right now is God made Christ to sit. And God made us to sit with him. Let us first consider the implications of this word sit. It holds the secret to a heavenly rebuild. Christianity never began with walking. It began with sitting. The Christian era began when Christ sitting down, of whom we're told that when he had paid the price for our sins, he sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. And with equal truth, we can say that our individual lives as Christians began when we were found in Christ Jesus. So all of that is just to simply say that when we by faith see ourselves seated together with him in heavenly places, God will give us more power to do more for the kingdom. Most Christians make the mistake of trying to work in order to be able to sit, but that is a reversal of the true order. Our natural reason says that if we do not work, how can we ever reach the goal? What can we accomplish without effort? How will we ever get anywhere if we don't move? But Christianity is a different lifestyle. If at the outset of our Christian life, we try to do anything, we'll get nothing. If we seek to attain something, we'll miss everything. For Christianity does not begin with a big do, but it starts with a big done. Thus, Ephesians 1 and 3, it opens with a statement that says, God has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. And we are invited at the onset of our salvation to just sit down and enjoy what God has done for us, not to set out to try and attain it for ourselves. We cannot earn the blessings of God. To rebuild implies an effort, but that effort is all God's. Whereas God says in Ephesians 2 and 8, that we are saved, not of ourselves, but by grace through faith. And we constantly speak of being saved through faith. But what does that mean? What does that mean? That means this simply, that we are saved by resting on the finished works of Jesus Christ. We've done nothing whatsoever to save ourselves. We simply laid ourselves upon him and the burdens of our sin-sick souls. We began our Christian life by depending on him and not upon our own doing, but upon what he has already done. And until a man does this, he's no Christian. This must be our confession. I can do nothing to save myself, but by his grace, God has done everything for me in Christ. And that is to take the first step in this life of faith. And this Christian walk from start to finish is based upon the simple principle of utter dependence upon the Lord Jesus. There is no limit to the grace God is willing to bestow upon us. He will give us everything, but we can receive nothing except as we begin to rest in him. Sitting is an attitude of rest. Something has been finished, work stopped, and we sit down. We can only rebuild in this Christian life as we learn, first of all, to just simply sit down. What does it mean to sit down? Well, when we walk or stand, we have all the weight on our body, on our legs. But when we sit down, our entire weight is shifted onto the chair or the couch on which we sit. 
We grow weary when we walk and stand, but we feel rested when we have sat down for a while. And walking or standing, we expend a great deal of energy. But when we are seated, we relax at once because the strain no longer falls upon our muscles and our nerves, but upon something on the outside of us. And so it is in the spirit realm. To sit down is simply to rest our whole weight, our whole load, ourselves, our future, everything upon the Lord. We let him bear the responsibility and we cease to bear it. This was God's principle from the beginning. In creation, God worked from the first day through the sixth day and rested on the seventh. We can truthfully say for the first six days, God did quite a bit of work. But when he finished his task, he set himself down because his work was finished. He ceased to work and the seventh day became the Sabbath day of the Lord. It was God's rest. But now let us look at Adam because he represents us. Where did Adam stand in relationship to the rest of the Lord? Adam, we're told, was created on the sixth day. Clearly then he had no part in those first six days of work, for he came into being only at the end. God's seventh day was in fact Adam's first day. Whereas God worked six days and then enjoyed his Sabbath, Adam began his day with the Sabbath, for God works before he rests. But man must first enter into God's rest before he began to do any kind of work. Moreover, it was because of God's work of creation was complete that Adam's life could begin with a rest. When you set your mind to think about what Adam was able to do and what he did on that first day, he just sat with Jesus and chilled. He thought about all that God had told him. He thought about all the animals that God brought to him one by one to name them. He thought about how God gave him a helpmate even when he was asleep. God put him to sleep and gave him a helpmate. He woke up, had a companion, a helper, and pleasure. Adam had it going on. Amen, amen. So all Adam had to do in that rest with the Lord was simply enjoy the company of God and remember all that God had done and taught him and enjoy the Sabbath. Now here's the gospel. That God had not only finished the work of creation, but he had also completed the work of redemption. And that we do not do anything whatsoever to earn it, but can enter by faith directly into his finished works and redemption. Of course, we know that between the two historical facts of creation and redemption, that there lies a tragic story of Adam's fall from grace, of his sin and of judgment, and of the coming of Jesus Christ to toil and to give himself until that lost position was recovered. Jesus explained as he went, my father worketh even now until now I work as he pursued his way. Only with the, when the atoning price was paid could he cry out in, in pain and say, it is finished. But because of that triumphant call, our analogy we've drawn is a complete one. Christianity indeed means that God has done everything for us in Christ and that we simply step by faith into the enjoyment of that fact. Our key word here of course, is, in, is not in his text context. It is a command to sit down. But the key word here is that we see ourselves as seated. Ephesians 1 and 18, that Paul prays that the eyes of our understanding would be enlightened to understand all that is contained for us in this double fact that God first by his mighty power raised Jesus up to sit in heavenly places by him and then raised us up by grace to sit along with him. Now, the first lesson we must learn is this, that work is not initially ours at all, but God's. It is not that we work for God, but that God works for us. God gives us a position of rest. He brings his son's finished work to us and presents it to us. And then he says to us, please sit down. His offer to us, Cannot, I think, be better expressed than in the words of that great feast, come, for all things are ready. And from this point forward in the Christian experience, nothing is done on the basis of our works, but everything is done on the finished work of another. Every spiritual experience begins with the acceptance of the fact that what God has done for us, and it all begins with a new sitting down. When he calls you to a new ministry, it begins once again with a new sitting down, if you like. Isaiah 43 and 19, it says, Behold, I'm doing a new thing. Now it springs forth. Do you not perceive it? 
All that is required from us is to see what God is saying and then sit in it. The ideas, the inventions, the dreams, the visions must first be seen and accepted by sitting in it. Yes, just sit and enjoy and let the Holy Spirit reveal the plans. Sit and hear the purposes of God. Sit and embrace the will of God for your life. Sit down and take that baby for a test ride. This is a principle of life and one which God himself has appointed. And from beginning to the end, each successive stage of the Christian life follows on the same divinely determined principle. See it, sit in it, see it, sit in it. Whether he calls you from level to level, first thing you have to do is see yourself there and then begin to sit in it. How do I receive the power of the spirit for service? Do I labor for it? Was I plead with God for it? Do I have to flick my soul with fasting and praying? Never. That is not the teaching of scripture. Think about it. How do we receive forgiveness of sins? Paul tells us in Ephesians chapter 1 verse 7 that it was according to the riches of his grace. And then in verse 6 of the same chapter, it says, And this was freely bestowed upon us in the beloved. We did nothing to earn it. We have our redemption through his blood, and that is the grounds for which we receive everything we did. Because Jesus died on the cross, my sins are forgiven. Because he was exalted to the throne, I am endowed with power from on high. And that one gift is no different than the others upon which I depend. It's never about what I've done. I haven't married for forgiveness. And neither do I merit the gift of the Spirit. I receive everything, not by walking, but by sitting down. Not by doing, but resting in the Lord. And so in recap, just as Adam entered into this Sabbath rest of God before he began to work, we must also sit in the finished work of Christ before we begin to work or to rebuild anything. In this rebuild, one of the first things you want to do is set your focus. When I say set your focus, that means see yourself as seated in Christ. Taking all the weights of your life, just imagine and let your mind go there. You're seated in Christ. Now release all family pressure. Release all financial pressures. Release all questions about your future to him. He says, casting all your cares upon him because he cared for you. He says, seeking first the kingdom of heaven and all these things will be what? Added to you. You've got to bring your soul to a place of rest. Take your will and tell your will that we're going to do just what God says for us to do. You speak to your heart. Tell your heart, heart, we won't be troubled no more. You speak to your emotions and you tell them we're going to line up with God's will. You will no longer drive me, but God's will will drive us. So be still and be quiet. We have our hope in God. And then begin with your thoughts. Take every thought captive and say to yourself, every need met. Every need met. If it's financial, every need met. If it's your children, Every need met. If your heart is broken, remind yourself that every need is met because I'm seated in heavenly places. What you're doing now is putting the weight on God and not on yourself. He gives the vision and he also gives the provision. And through his grace, he will fulfill it all. It's not your reputation on the line for the things that God has called you to do. But it's on God because you work for him. Secondly, when you take your seat, and any time a student takes his seat, the teacher will then appear. We learn to listen for Holy Ghost because he will speak and empower us. When you are seated in your dream, your idea, your invention, when it is locked into your soul, you will begin to move mountains and cause walls to fall. Yes, yes. And Paul would say many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord is able to deliver us from us all. We will suffer and struggle, but always see yourself in a place of victory. No matter how tough the going gets, see yourself in a place of victory. Trust the Holy Spirit to speak to you. Listen to him because he will speak and empower you. Yes, when you're seated in your dream and your idea and your invention, when it is locked into your soul, you will move mountains once again and cause walls to fall. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. 
David in the Psalms of uh, 110 and one, he said, the Lord said unto my Lord, sit thou at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. What you have to do is set your affections on things that are above and not things on this earth. Set your affections on your seat. This is about the resting of your entire soul, your mind, your will, your thoughts, your emotions. Place them all on that seat that's in Christ Jesus. If you let that become your weapon, your resting place, God will make your enemies your footstool. Whenever there's family issues, this can be quickly resolved because your family was never your resting place. Your faith was never seated in there. When financial issues rise against you, this can be quickly resolved and successfully because your finances was never your resting place. Your resting place is in him. Concerns about your health will not trouble you because your resting place is in heavenly places. And all these things that God would turn into a footstool for you because your soul is resting in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. After you set your focus, the second thing you need to do is start thinking outside of the box. Don't allow facts to hinder your possibilities. Remember, God has prepared for us things that eyes haven't seen and ears haven't heard. Neither has it entered into the minds of men. Adam's problem was his sin. His sin was eating from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And ever since that day, men have been trying to determine what is right, what is wrong. And they're all thinking according to facts instead of trusting the word of God. Our rebuild is based on saying whatever God says to us in spite of the facts because we know that God's word is true. When you start thinking outside of the box, you start speaking faith over facts. Facts are always subject to change, but the truth of God's word remains the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. With facts, things that are true today can become false tomorrow. Because it's all subject to the will of God. So choose facts, uh, faith over facts. And remember that your response to the world comes from God's executive suite. Which is far above rulers, powers, principalities. For all these things are subject to him. That's why you can invest in a location or idea that others have failed in. And yet you prosper. And you proper, prosper simply because your response was from your seat which is seated far above all other things. You can be a businessman going into an arena, into an area where nobody else is able to achieve any type of victory. But victory is yours if you do it because God told you to. Remember, you got to trust faith over facts. That's why you're still here today, because you're seated in heavenly places. You're still in the game because you're seated in heavenly places. What you've endured should have ruined you, but you're in it but you're not of it. And your response is always from on high. And whatever the God on high says, we will declare it on earth. So many times I've said to myself, let the redeem of the Lord say so. Because I've had so many challenges, but I know my soul has been redeemed. So I just say so to everything that tell me that I'm not able. I say so to everything that look to tell me I can't make it. I say so to everything that tells me that I'm not educated enough. I am the redeemed of the Lord. And regardless of the facts, I tell everything simply so. The power of life and death is in my tongue. When God went to work, he spoke life into dark things. Jesus couldn't even die until he quit talking. I talk and I use the power of my tongue to achieve everything that God has for me. Don't allow what you see or experience to change your faith confession. Facts are subject to change. Acknowledge the facts as real, but also temporal. If you're sick, don't ignore the fact that you're sick. That's why you're taking medicine and you got a doctor's appointment for tomorrow. But even with your medication, take your medication and declare that the, the side effects in this medicine will not kill you, but all of the medicine will begin to work together for your good. When you need money for your vision, but you're broke and oh, everybody in town still believe that God will support the vision he's given you when you begin to walk up right before him. When people tell you no, it doesn't mean never. It simply means not now. You, can, you just keep looking for your yes. Tell yourself that God is raising up people to help you. Your faith will require an investment of hurt, rejection, and doubt. 
same as it did for every great man of God in scripture, same as it did for our beloved Savior. You have to make that initial investment of hurt, rejection, and doubt. But trust Holy Ghost because he will confirm and strengthen your heart to continue on. Once we make a confession of faith, five things will begin to happen for you. The first thing is that God will give you a grace to go through the situation that you're facing. The second thing, plans will be revealed to you step by step. Thirdly, angels will be released to minister to you. Fourth, your troubles are being held back by the hand of God. You just stand in faith and know because I've asked him, God's hand is holding back my trouble. It could be worse, but not today. Hallelujah. And the fifth thing is people are going to come alongside to help you. People may not come when you want them, but when they do come, they'll be right on time to help you. Be a finish is our third thing. Become detailed minded. In Matthew 25, 23, it says, you have been faithful over a few things. I'll make you a ruler over many things. Remember, it is the small details in the natural that have a great impact in the spiritual. Take care of the small things that God set before you. Learn to finish them and don't settle for less than what God has promised you that he is willing to do for you. Remember, others are waiting on you to finish. Stay the course. Stick with the plan that God gave you for your rebuild. For the vision is yet for an appointed time. There's a time when the plan that God gave you will come to fruition and it will speak and not lie. Though it tarries, wait on it. For because it will surely come, it will not tarry. Just wait on your plan. Hold on to what God has said. Sit in your seat and trust God and believe God for it will come through and stay the course. Jesus couldn't die until he had completed everything God had given him to do. Stay the course. If Jesus could stay the course, he would give you the strength to simply stay the course. In this time of rebuild, set your mind to stay focused. Set your mind to sit in heavenly places. Set your mind to think it outside of the box, speaking facts over faith. Set your mind to be a finish and become detail minded. You've got to trust God no matter what happens and speak faith over facts. Let your, let your, set your mind that your faith will be seated in Christ Jesus. Don't make your family the seat. They'll let you down. Don't make your finances the seat. It'll change any day. Don't let your future become your seat. The future's in the hands of the Lord. Stay the course. Be strong and of a good courage and know that God will strengthen your heart. Now, I want to take this time to begin harvest for those that have given up. Believing that God was going to come through for them. For those that feel that they're not worthy because of things that have happened in their lives and mistakes that they have made. Those are yet still are in the struggle and don't know what God has in store for you. I can hear the Spirit say, he that has begun a great work in you, he's faithful to perform it. Faithful to perform it. Always saying to you today, if you would just sit still and trust Jesus Christ, everything he has promised you, he'll bring to fruition. If you would just, in this time of rebuild, sit down and wait on the Lord. This is for those of you that never knew Jesus in the pardon of your sins, that he's a faithful God and he's a good God. He has plans for you. The only reason why you're still here today is because God has plans to work everything out for your good. If you would just trust him. All you have to do is confess with your mouth what you believe in your heart that Christ has died for your sins. Went down in the grave and God raised him up and he sits on the right hand of glory right now. And you shall be saved. Amen.